How do you feel about jealousy? I can confidently say that if there's a feeling of jealousy, it's not just arbitrary. In any case, jealousy doesn't lead to anything good, and you need to solve this problem by communicating with your partner or by seeking help from a specialist. I did neither, and I faced terrible consequences. I recall reading that in a large survey, over 90% of individuals claimed to have said the same thing following a vehicle crash. It wasn't a multiple choice question. Rather, it required filling in the blank. Perhaps it wasn't the appropriate time to find humor in such a situation, but I found myself aligning with that majority. It dawned on me that this marked the first instance where I was the cause of a collision. Previously, I had been the one struck. My face met the airbag upon impact, yet surprisingly I didn't feel any pain. A couple of silver linings. There was a distinct smell of radiator fluid, indicating likely damage, and I also caught a whiff of brake fluid. Oddly, I didn't feel disoriented. The reality of the situation didn't match my expectations. As I sat there contemplating, I realized I hadn't really envisioned how it would unfold. On the bright side, there was no scent of gasoline or smoke, though my truck had ceased running. It seemed returning to work was out of the question. I had this nagging feeling that my truck would collide with the wall, shattering glass everywhere. Did it happen like that? Hell no. It was far worse. Not only did my truck crash into the wall, it plowed straight through until it was completely inside. If I could find a mirror, I'd gauge how far into the room I'd gone, but with my face pressed against the airbag, visibility was zero. I couldn't tell how much time had passed when a concerned voice asked if I was hurt. How was I supposed to answer with my lips on the airbag? The commotion grew, and then a woman screamed, people are hurt. Oh my god, it's bad. Well, she definitely wasn't referring to me, which was a relief. Sirens wailed in the distance. Fire trucks have a distinct sound compared to ambulances. I figured one of each was about to arrive on the scene. It was chaotic. They were prioritizing the severely injured, while I, they used a chain and a winch to pull my truck back into the glaring midday sun. I emerged with only minor scratches and bruises. Another ambulance was busy loading a stretcher. The first one had departed a few minutes earlier. After a pat down, they shoved me, handcuffed, into the back of a police car. Seems like losing control of your truck can still land you in trouble. At least I wasn't an immigrant facing a potential 110-year prison sentence. I wasn't sure why they didn't take me away immediately, but it gave me a chance to assess the damage. My truck had plowed through the wall, demolishing the door, window, and air conditioner. It didn't stop until it rammed the bed and box springs into the bathroom. Room 6 and 10 appeared unscathed, while room 8 was now out of commission. Well, at least it was a single-story building. My anger surged when I saw Joe loitering around the motel. I may not be a genius, but I was relieved I intervened. I refused to speak to the police. Surprisingly, the orange jumpsuit wasn't as uncomfortable as I anticipated. The cot, however, was. I wonder how the occupants of room 8 are faring. As I anticipated, I thought the truck would simply crash through the window. Nevertheless, I couldn't suppress my smile. Excuse my lack of manners. I'm Vince Clancy, 23 years old, married to a woman of the same age named Jenny. After high school, we made some mistakes and didn't achieve much. Despite not yet having a visible baby bump, we decided to marry. Unfortunately, two months later, Jenny had a miscarriage. Although it affected me, Jenny took it very personally. After six months of counseling, we agreed to postpone trying for a baby for a few years. However, her mood swings persist to this day. Moreover, our impromptu wedding derailed our plans for college. Instead of pursuing a degree, I took up a job to train as an electrician. Jenny found work as a temporary laborer, often filling in as a receptionist. Her assignments vary from just one day to occasionally lasting a week when someone goes on vacation. 
During my high school years, I participated in football without any major embarrassments. Jenny, one of the six basketball cheerleaders, faithfully attended all of my football games, and I reciprocated by supporting her at every basketball game. While Jenny's intention was likely to show her support for me, my motive was to shield her from unwanted attention. The basketball players and their associates were constantly trying to win her over, but none of them succeeded in swaying my feelings. The standout player on the basketball team was Joe Clark. Although we didn't share any close ties or mutual friends, our social circles rarely intersected. Nonetheless, Joe occasionally made suggestive remarks to Jenny, which she brushed off with a laugh. As someone prone to jealousy, I found it challenging to remain unaffected by his remarks. While I received honorable mention for the All-State team, Joe's recognition was limited to second-team All-Conference, largely due to the poor performance of our basketball team. Despite this, Joe secured a scholarship for books and meals at a nearby Division I college and joined summer leagues on campus after graduation. To my surprise, he earned playing time once the season began, proving himself to be a decent player when not surrounded by teammates prone to turnovers. Joe often brought his friends back for events like homecoming, including one particularly obnoxious individual named Nolan Larson, who enjoyed a godlike status due to his team's contention for a postseason playoff spot. Nolan consistently flirted with Ginny, sometimes even in my presence despite her being married. Jenny brushed it off with laughter. Occasionally, I had to intervene, which seemed to only aggravate Ginny. Joe and Nolan seemed inseparable, often together during Joe's visits to our town. To avoid their behavior, I usually made sure we were occupied elsewhere. While homecoming lasted just a weekend, summer vacations were longer, leading to several disagreements between Ginny and me. Are you my husband or my guardian? I'm capable of taking care of myself. Those guys are just loudmouths. Can we drop it? It's easier said than done when you're prone to jealousy. Adding to the frustration was Ginny's noticeable attractiveness, garnering attention even while line dancing. Proud, yes. Jealous, also yes. Crazy. Didn't think so, but now it's uncertain. Hello, Mr. Clancy. I'm Scott Jensen. Your assigned lawyer for this court proceeding said a young man, barely older than me. He might just be a few years ahead of my age. The clock shows it's around two, so good afternoon, Scott. You can call me Vince. How much do you recall about the truck accident, Vince? Everything. Was it your intention to cause the crash? Not really. I just wanted to intimidate them. I didn't realize a truck moving at that speed could cause such extensive damage. The police report indicates you were traveling at about 30 miles per hour when you collided with the motel room. That's not considered slow. Perhaps when my anger took over, I accelerated, but I didn't plan to break through the wall. That should count for something. Unlikely. Currently, you're charged with two counts of vehicular assault. If Mr. Larson passes away, these charges may escalate to include attempted murder as well. Wow, sounds pretty serious. Yeah, that air conditioner you threw ended up hitting Mr. Larson right in the lower back. He's got a lot of internal injuries, but surprisingly, it might have saved their lives. It knocked them over the bed just before your truck pinned them against the wall with the mattress. How's your wife doing? You mean Mrs. Larson? Well, the impact from Mr. Larson hitting her fractured some facial bones. She's lost most of her front teeth, and Mr. Larson has some serious scars now, if you catch my drift. That's unfortunate, but aside from that, they're mostly okay. Not even close. They both have multiple broken bones. The mattress didn't do much when the truck shoved everything into the bathroom. Mr. Larson might even be paralyzed. I'd pretend to be sad, but honestly, I'm not feeling it, Scott. I get it, but how did you even know they were in that room? Because when they went in and shut the door, I saw the room number. 8. You're still getting the hang of this, huh, Scott? Getting a little flustered now. 
Let me rephrase, how did you know to be there at that specific time? I had decided to surprise Ginny with a bouquet of flowers for our anniversary and had plans to ask her out to lunch if she had the time. She was filling in for someone on maternity leave with a job that had no set end date. As I turned the corner, I spotted her standing outside her office building while waiting for the traffic light to change. A flashy sports car pulled up and she got in. I trailed behind them. So what happened at the motel? Did you confront them? Well, their car stopped at the check-in area and Ginny got out. I was still waiting for a chance to turn into the parking lot from the main road. The sports car parked around the building, so I followed suit. Ginny came out of the office a few minutes later and headed to room number 8. He joined her shortly after she arrived. The rest, as they say, is history. So you don't know what they were doing. You're really new to this, aren't you, Scott? Do you think they were planning a surprise anniversary dinner for me? Sloppy seconds. Vince, I'm here to assist you, but I need all the details. How long did you wait in your truck before you confronted them? I waited a couple of minutes, I guess, and then rage clouded my judgment. I lost control, no excuses, complete meltdown. As I said, I just wanted to scare them. Ginny gradually awakened from her extended sleep, penning her thoughts on the notepad provided by the nurse. Where am I? What happened? Mrs. Clancy, you're at Mercy General. A truck crashed into your room, causing several broken bones and internal injuries. The doctor has sedated you. If you're still in pain, we can adjust your medication. How are you feeling? Ginny hastily wrote down her next inquiries. My face feels covered with bandages and my mouth is immobilized. Why am I restrained? I can't move my legs or my other arm. Your arm and both legs are in casts. In fact, you're in a full body cast. Your face is heavily bandaged and your mouth is when you're ready, there's a detective who needs to ask you some questions. Shall I call him? She scribbled back, yes. Several hours passed. Mrs. Clancy, I'm Detective Green. How's your memory? With a fading pencil, she replied. Not good, I suppose. I don't recall the accident. The nurse mentioned I was hit by a truck. What do you remember about Tuesday morning? She wrote slowly. You mean today? Today is actually Friday. You've been here for ten days. I suspect they placed you in a medically induced coma. With trembling hands, oh my god, I dressed a bit nicer and went to work. What did you do for lunch? After hesitating for a few moments, I went to lunch with a friend. And who is this friend? Throwing him under the bus. Nolan Larson. Where did you two have lunch? I can't recall. Does the Hump Day Motel sound familiar? Tears began to soak the bandages. I rented a room while Nolan parked. Is that when I was hit by the truck? You wish. No, you were in the room with Mr. Larson when the truck smashed into it. More scratching. Someone lost control of their truck. Not quite. It seems your little rendezvous wasn't the anniversary surprise your husband was expecting. With a trembling cast. My anniversary. Oh God, so this wasn't a plan approved by your husband beforehand. Quickly, no. That's all I have for now. Best of luck with your recovery. Mr. Larson, are you able to hear me? The nurse glanced at the doctor. He hasn't shown any reaction since he was told about his spinal injury and that he won't be able to walk again. Well, that certainly ended his promising career abruptly, remarked the surgeon. The nurse is CED. It's a steep price to pay for seeking affection from a married woman. My friends and family offered to cover my bail. Once this chaotic ordeal is over, I'm leaving. The threats to my life for putting an end to Nolan's career aren't worth staying out of jail until my trial. I'll do my time and then disappear. Try to catch me if you can. About ten weeks after the incident, Ginny came to visit. 
She arrived in a wheelchair but managed to hobble over to the visitor's room using crutches. Ginny, you seem to be doing well. Her tone was flat. I'm sorry I caused all of this. Did you really intend to harm me physically? No, I just wanted to scare you and put an end to your affair. How's your throat? That's not funny, Vince. You have to believe me. I never cheated on you before and you stopped it before it went too far. How did you find out? I had picked up some flowers for our anniversary and planned to surprise you at work. If you wanted out, why didn't you just say so? I didn't want out. I don't know why I did it. He was a celebrity and I fell for his lies. You know he's paralyzed now, right? Yeah, I heard. Maybe you should sign him up for the Special Olympics. You two would make a great team in the modified potato sack race. I suppose I deserve that. I just wanted to express my apologies for everything. I hope your trial goes smoothly. It seems like you had quite the agenda that afternoon. While I was in the squad car, I noticed Joe Clark looking around. How did he know you'd be there? Oh, Vince, I'm so sorry, she said as tears streamed down her face. To be honest, I wasn't jealous anymore. Once my love for Ginny faded, I no longer cared about her actions or who she was involved with. I was angry with myself for being so naive. Hey, if you can locate where they towed my truck, the flowers I bought for our anniversary are probably still in the front seat somewhere. I heard you took a bite out of the big star. How was it? Ginny didn't reply. Instead, she gestured rudely, then got up and limped back to her wheelchair. Visitors are always appreciated. They lift your spirits. As my trial drew near, the passing weeks seemed to blur together. I turned down all offers for bail. Just days before the trial, I finally accepted a plea deal. The prospect of a year in prison seemed preferable to the lengthy sentence I might face if the jury found me guilty of attempted murder. After the basketball team lost, I received hate mail. When they missed the playoffs, I even received death threats. It's absurd. It's just a game. One of Scott's acquaintances initiated divorce proceedings on my behalf. It was in all necessary signatures obtained. I'd soon be single. Unexpectedly, my lawyer showed up. Scott, it's been a while. How's my case looking? Well, the DA is offering time served in two years on parole. Scott, tell him I want to relocate as soon as I'm released. With the ongoing death threats, parole won't suffice. Show him these letters. See if you can negotiate something. The following week, I was moved to a processing center to serve the remainder of my reduced sentence for the felony I pleaded guilty to. I'd be out in a few weeks and leaving the state on the same day. With my finances drained, branded a felon, and no prospect of a decent credit score for years, the future looked grim. Jenny made another visit a few days before my expected release. She walked with a slight limp, but otherwise seemed relatively normal. What brings you here, Jenny? We're divorced now, I remarked. My last visit didn't go as planned. I wanted to apologize once more. If it weren't for me, you wouldn't be here, she said. Well, Jenny, I'm in prison because I couldn't control my anger. That's on me. I admit I lost control. I could have just left and filed for divorce or disappeared, but I'm serving time because of my actions. I won't blame anyone else, I replied. Still, you were angry because of what I was doing. Do you like my new teeth? She asked. As lovely as ever. How are your boyfriends? I inquired. No need to be mean. I tried to ignore any talk or rumors about them. If I had one wish that I knew would come true, I'd wish you had arrived with your flowers ten minutes earlier. We'd still be together, and I wouldn't have made the worst mistake of my life, she confessed. Touching, Jenny, but it seems the deities you're praying to aren't in the wish-granting business. Where are you working now? I asked. 
I have a full-time job as a receptionist at Stone Masonry. Same routine every day. No husband waiting for me at home. All my fault. What are your plans after you're released? She inquired. I'm leaving the state. I still receive hate mail weekly for ruining Nolan's career. I'll probably try to lay low for a while, I replied. Do you have any room in your plans for me? She asked. Answer me this. Why did you throw Yusa away? I countered. I wish I could give you a satisfying answer, but I don't think I can, she admitted, and that's why at this point I just want to leave and start over alone. But thanks for the offer. Remembering the good times has helped me get through this ordeal, I said. Well, if you change your mind, you know where to find me. You'll always be welcome in my arms, she said softly. Yeah, right. Until next time. Thanks, but no thanks, I replied. Kinney's tears slowly streamed down her face. The van journey to the downtown bus terminal occurred on a dreary day, with dry streets contrasting the still moist sidewalks, mirroring my inner mood perfectly. I utilized my bus fare to travel to the city where my parents resided. They had arranged for me to receive an old truck and a modest sum of a few hundred dollars, a gesture of generosity considering their tight financial situation. Three days and two states later, my funds depleted. Despite finding various odd jobs, the earnings were insufficient for sustenance and shelter. Pressing onward in my beat-up vehicle, I resorted to begging on street corners to scrape together enough money to purchase a basic phone. Its primary purpose was to search for job opportunities online, leading me to secure employment with a transient construction company in need of an electrician, offering cash payments on a daily basis. Although I formed connections with new acquaintances, my once outgoing demeanor waned. I settled into a budget motel room as my temporary residence where the neighboring woman engaged in solicitation, a prospect that held some appeal for me, though I must clarify, not in terms of solicitation, but possibly as a client, if only finances were not so constrained. She noticed me staring one evening and slightly opened her robe. Ready for some action? Only if you accept IOUs, she laughed. Let me think about it, no. Well, I guess I don't have anything to offer if you don't need an electrician. Too bad, you look quite fit. I appreciate a man who can take charge. I'll remember that for the future. Actually, one of my clients mentioned a project involving Sparks. Can't chat now, need to get ready for my next appointment, she chuckled. We were just anonymous individuals trying to get through the night. Sleep was elusive as I imagined being with her. Damn, I needed some action. A few days later, I encountered the escort again. She handed me a piece of paper. I mentioned to my client that I knew an electrician. Here's the number. Thanks, you didn't have to do that. I know. See you later, she said as got into her modern sedan and drove away. I needed to inquire about the rates for miscellaneous tasks for my colleagues at work. Armed with that information, I dialed the number. To my astonishment, a woman picked up. Oh no, I certainly don't want this woman to discover that her husband was with a prostitute. Um, hi there. I got your number from a friend. I heard you're looking for an electrician. Yeah, what are your rates and when are you available? Well, I typically work Monday to Friday until around 6. For small jobs, I can do evenings, otherwise weekends. Charging by the day is more cost-effective than hourly, I explained, hoping she wouldn't hang up as I mentioned rates. We introduced ourselves. She was Deb. I noted down her address. I'd agreed to swing by on Saturday morning to assess the job. Arriving on Saturday, I was surprised to find it was a gated community. After confirming my arrival, I navigated through to her address. Only one car in the garage, so her husband must be out golfing or something. Deb seemed to be around my mother's age and I noticed she wasn't wearing any rings. Something didn't quite add up. 
She needed the ground fault outlet in the master bath replaced and wanted some light switches changed to motion sensors. There were pictures of young adults on her wall, but none with a father figure. I noticed only one pillow on her bed. It dawned on me that there might not be a husband in the picture after all. I provided Deb with an estimate and she paid me in advance to purchase the necessary materials. After a quick trip to Lowe's, I finished the job well before lunchtime. While I was working, Deb kindly brought me a soda and a tray of cookies. Which of my acquaintances informed you that I needed an electrician? Deb inquired. I hesitated, unsure of how to respond. Should I mention that it was a woman I met at the questionable motel where I currently reside? I don't know her name. She overheard me discussing my profession as an electrician and we briefly conversed. She's a strawberry blonde around 5 foot 5, I replied. Ah, uh, I see. I have some friends who might be interested in your services. Would you mind if I passed along your contact information? Deb asked. That would be fantastic. I'm in dire need of funds at the moment, I admitted. What other skills do you possess? Deb asked playfully with a hint of mischief in her eyes. Now thoroughly confused, I wondered if she was friends with the woman from the motel or perhaps even romantically interested in me. My cheeks flushed with embarrassment. Attempting to reciprocate the flirtation, I replied, I'm young and not afraid to break a sweat. Deb chuckled at my response. I'll be sure to inform them, she said smiling. My imagination desired more, but I hastily stashed the cash into my jeans and drove off. Not long after, I received a call from an unfamiliar number. Vince speaking. Hey, glad I reached you. Deb passed me your number. I live a couple of doors down from her. Could you swing by? A female voice asked. Yeah, I'm just grabbing a quick bite. What's your address? After committing her address to memory, I finished my sandwich and headed over. It took some time to navigate past the security checkpoint since I only had an address, not a name. Eventually, I was granted entry. In the garage, two cars were parked with their doors wide open. I opted to park on the street. My beat-up car was undoubtedly the shabbiest vehicle in the neighborhood. When I timidly knocked on her door, I was met by a very cute, albeit young, lady. Um, you called about an odd job. She rolled her eyes. Mom, it's for you, she said, turning and leaving me standing there. When the lady of the house arrived, I could see the resemblance. You must be Vince. Do you handle tasks like replacing ceiling fans and installing motion detecting light switches? Oh, and I need more outlets in the garage. Yes, 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 and yes, have I covered everything. I joked. Then come this way. After noting down her list of requests, I jokingly asked, have you purchased everything you want installed? By the way, should I just call you mom of the eye rolling daughter? She chuckled in response. My name's Nancy. That's Jolene. She's waiting for her boyfriend and getting very annoyed. Sorry about that. No, I haven't bought anything yet. We can head to Lowe's and shop if you'd like. Oh, and what's the cost for installation? I quickly estimated the costs and handed her the figures. Let's go then. Would you like to drive? Sure. However, her willingness to drive changed when she saw my old car. Oh, I'll drive. We can fit everything in my trunk and back seat. Well, if you insist. Haven't ridden in a car as nice as yours in a long time, if ever. It took me until sundown to complete her projects. Jolene kept watching me, still upset about being stood up by her boyfriend. Between the two jobs, I made close to a thousand dollars after adding tips to my quotes. If you've ever relied solely on the cash in your pocket day in and day out, you can't fully grasp the fear of being robbed when you have some money on you. I didn't sleep well, suspecting that everyone could somehow tell that I had a thousand dollars in my pockets just by looking at me. 
My first stop on Monday would be to open a checking account and get a debit card. Having some funds in my bank account, I decided to venture out on Monday night. Though the idea of paying an escort for sex excited me, I couldn't bring myself to do it. Instead, I headed to the local bar and took a seat at the counter. I wasn't actively seeking company, but there were women there who were. Are you planning to stare at your drink all night? Some of us have made an effort to look good and you haven't even glanced our way, said a woman as I looked up and noticed her. I pretended to appraise her appearance. Well, you certainly look very nice. After a moment's pause, she responded. Is that all? Not going to ask me to dance or buy me a drink? Nah, it seems like you're on the hunt. I figured I'd let you take charge. She rolled her eyes and turned back to her friends. I imagine she was telling them what a jerk I was. I had only come in for a drink and to wallow in self-pity. Can't a guy do that without being hit on? About thirty minutes later, the only woman not dancing walked over and sat beside me. You're not checking out the guys, so I'm guessing you're dealing with women trouble, she remarked. Nope, not anymore. So what's on your mind? I'd rather not talk about it. I'm just enjoying my beer and the scenery. What about you? My friends and I like coming here to drink and dance. Guys always think they're going to get lucky, but that's not why we're here. Don't get me wrong, there are plenty of women looking for some excitement, even married ones if you're into a bit of risk. In a small town like this, who would have thought such activities happened at night? We don't see ourselves as a small town, so you must be one of those big city slickers. Yeah, I suppose. I never really got into the nightclub scene. Why's that? You're not bad to look at. I got married early, money was tight, so our nights out were spent at friends' parties or at the movies. Didn't work out, I presume, since I don't see a ring. Bingo. Well, I came here to dance, and if you're not going to ask me, I'll catch up with you later. Ashley's my name. I'm Vince. Nice chatting with you, Ashley. As I lay in bed that night, I realized it wasn't sex that I desired. It was companionship. Just talking with Ashley had lifted my spirits. I became somewhat of a regular at the local bar, having dinner there almost every evening. I wasn't looking to hook up, just to talk. The next time Ashley and her friends came in, I asked her to dance. Although invited to join them at their table, I declined. Conflicting emotions had me wondering which way was up. I received another referral call from the work I'd done for Deb. This lady lived in a different part of town. My Saturday morning was now booked. On the following Friday evening, I found myself perched on a bar stool, nibbling on a mix of pickles, hard-boiled eggs, and pretzels when I felt a tap on my shoulder. Glancing up into the mirror, I spotted her standing there. Hey, Ashley, where's your group? I inquired. They're tending to the horses.